Funding for this program was provided in part by BYU Religious Education and the Religious Studies Center. The Sydney B. Sperry Symposium Address by Elder Joe J. Christensen was given on October 26, 2007. Good evening, brothers and sisters and friends. It's hard to believe that 51 years ago, in 1956, I enrolled at uh, Brigham Young University as a first-year graduate student. I've been invited to teach two religion classes. The dean assigned me to share office space with Brother Reed Bankhead in the old Joseph Smith building. The entrance to his office was through the same outer door as that of Dr. Sidney B. Sperry. I'd enrolled in religion classes taught by both of these brethren. I felt like a pygmy every time I entered the area. If Dr. Sperry were here today, I think I'd feel the same way. I'd read and quoted from many of Dr. Sperry's articles and books and learned to admire him years before having the relatively close geographical proximity for that academic year. I had several opportunities to visit with him personally on one scriptural or doctrinal question or another. He treated me with courtesy and deference far beyond that, that which I felt I deserved. He made me feel very much at home and so doubly. I consider it a privilege to be here with you today at this symposium that bears his name. He certainly is one of the great intellectual gospel scholars of our modern era. In the previous 35 Sperry Symposium, much distinguished scholarly research has been presented and published, adding to the wealth of information benefiting all of us. And I pay tribute to those who have made such contributions because they have helped us as the Apostle Peter said, to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh a reason of the hope that is in us. This symposium is distinctive in that it centers on the practical application of the precepts taught in the Book of Mormon, precepts that can help us draw nearer to God. My hope is that all of us who hear or read the content of this symposium will be prompted to do some deep soul searching and discover the areas wherein the Book of Mormon provides us with the precepts that, if applied in our lives, can bring us closer to God. This is an occasion for all of us, literally, to be doers of the Word and not hearers only. The Book of Mormon has not always held the place in our church educational system that it does today. For example, I have a seminary graduation pin which in my day was commonly worn by those who had completed three high school years of seminary study. The courses included classes in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and church history. In some few areas where ninth graders were permitted to take seminary, a Book of Mormon course had been approved, but that didn't happen until 1961, 49 years after the first seminary program was initiated adjacent to Granite High School in Salt Lake City in 1912. Here's a little historical background that those of us who are older may recall. In 1970, when Brother Neil A. Maxwell was appointed commissioner of the church educational system, I was called home shortly after um, having been appointed to serve in the Mexico City Mission to assist as associate commissioner for seminaries and institutes of religion. The Church Board of Education at that time consisted of all of the First Presidency, all of the members of the Twelve, the presiding bishop, and Sister Belle Spafford, who then was the general president of the Relief Society. In March of 1972, we placed on the board's agenda a quiet yet revolutionary proposal that the graduation requirements for seminary would be increased from three years to four years with the Book of Mormon as one of the required courses. The board <clears throat> approved, and I recall a personal uh, conversation with Elder, uh, then acting president of the Twelve, Spencer W. Kimball, and he said, I wonder why we haven't done this years ago. 
From that time on, every seminary graduate has had the privilege of completing a course of study in this most important, life-changing volume of Scripture, the Book of Mormon. And for that, I'm very grateful. From the time the Book of Mormon came off the press at Grandin, the Grandin Press in Palmyra, New York in 1830, 177 years ago, there have been more than 133 million copies distributed around the world. And it has been published in 106 languages with more to come. The familiar introduction to the Book of Mormon contains this declaration by the Prophet Joseph Smith. I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth and the keystone of our religion, and a man could get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than any other book. I searched the Oxford English Dictionary for the definition of key words relating to the Prophet Joseph Smith's statement about the Book of Mormon, abide, abiding, and precept. Of the more than 20 definitions of the words, the following seem to relate most specifically to what we're discussing today. Precept means a general command or injunction, an instruction, direction, or rule for action or conduct, especially an injunction as to moral conduct, a maxim most commonly applied to divine commands. Abide means to stand firm by, hold to, remain true to. The Book of Mormon is filled with precepts, directions, rules, and commandments that, if applied in our lives, will help draw us closer to God than the precepts we'll find in any other book. I submit that anyone who reads the Book of Mormon and receives a testimony of its truthfulness by the power of the Holy Ghost will be motivated to live a life more consistent with the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. He or she will become a better person. The Book of Mormon is action-oriented. It is motivational. As long as the Spirit continues to strive with such individuals, their consciences will not let them be completely at peace until they improve their lives. Abiding by the precepts, teachings, and commandments so clearly taught in its pages will help a person proximately in this life and ultimately in the life to come. Personally, I owe so much to the Book of Mormon. To illustrate, permit me to share a simple and yet profound personal experience which I had almost 60 years ago while serving as a newly called missionary in Mexico. In those days, an elder's call to a second language mission was for two and a half years, allowing an extra six months to work on the language since there was no LTM or MTC to accelerate language preparation. After just two months in the field, I was assigned to serve in the beautiful city of Cuernavaca, Morelos, with my senior companion, Elder Bradshaw, who had been in the field just one month longer than I had. And we were both struggling to unravel what people were saying. They spoke so rapidly that what we heard was like one long, continuous word. Understanding was one thing, but uh, learning how to express ourselves was yet another. We were struggling, working, and praying to help to become more competent and comfortable with the language and the message. We'd been out, of, out all day, attempting with our very limited Spanish to find someone who would listen to what we had to say. No one had responded. Discouraged and in a gloomy rain, we returned to our apartment, located immediately across the street from the largest Catholic church in the city. There tacked to our door, we found a note which informed us that as Mormons, we were not welcome in that city and that for our own safety, we should leave as soon as possible. I went in and slumped down, sitting on the side of my bed. A flood of depressing thoughts and questions went through my mind. What was I doing so far away from home? Even though we had a very important message, no one seemed to want to hear it. And besides, they spoke a language I was just beginning to speak and understand. We weren't even welcome. Rather than wasting my time here, wouldn't it be better if I were back at the university or home helping dad on the farm? I had my triple combination in my hands and it fell open to Alma, chapter 29. The first verses met my gaze and I read, 
oh, that I were an angel, and could have the wish of mine heart, that I might go forth and speak with the trump of God, to sh with a voice to shake the earth, and cry repentance unto every people, especially those inhospitable folks who attacked that note on the door. Yea, <clears throat> I would declare unto every soul as with a voice of thunder, repentance and the plan of salvation, that they should repent and come unto our God, that there might not be more sorrow upon all the face of the earth. That was exactly how I felt. And then my eyes fell upon these words in the next verse, but behold, I am a man and do sin in my wish, for I ought to be content with the things which the Lord hath allotted unto me. That was all it took. Then and there I decided I really ought to be content with the things the Lord had allotted to me. From that moment on, I was never discouraged or homesick again. The Book of Mormon's message had changed me for the better, not only for my mission, but in many situations in my life since. My whole outlook changed. I committed to be grateful and content with the things the Lord has allotted to me. A few days later, things in our missionary lives began to look up. We met with the, met the Jesus Franco family. They listened, and the messages of the gospel and the Book of Mormon touched their hearts. The whole family was baptized. Brother Franco eventually became the branch president, and years later he was ordained to be the first patriarch in their newly created stake. Since then, the message of the Book of Mormon has changed the hearts of many people in Cuernavaca where there are now multiple stakes. That area is the headquarters for one of the newest established missions in the church. You remember in August of 2005, President Gordon B. Hinckley issued the challenge to all members of the church to read the Book of Mormon before the end of the year. Near the end of December, several members of the church were on a Delta Airlines flight, returning from their business trips to the east and obviously were attempting to meet the goal of finishing their reading of the Book of Mormon before midnight on New Year's Eve. A flight attendant passed by one of them and said, I don't know what it is that you're all reading, but those other guys back there are ahead of you. <clears throat> now, if we can conservatively assume that just 25% of the members of the church, or one out of four, met President Hinckley's challenge and read the Book of Mormon, that would mean approximately three million members of the church fulfilled the goal. Susan Easton Black's careful research calculated that there are 3,925 references to, to the Savior in the Book of Mormon. That means that on average there's a reference to the Lord every 1.7 verses. If three million members fulfilled the reading assignment, then, as a church, we were exposed to about 12 billion references to the Savior, his teachings, his personal ministry, and his revelations to his New World prophets in that five-month period. That could only be a plus to the church and to the reinforcement in the minds of members that the Book of Mormon is literally another witness that Jesus is the Christ. In President Benson, Ezra Taft Benson's first general conference address, given after he was sustained as president of the church in 1986, I was impressed with the emphasis he placed on the Book of Mormon. He said, There is a book we need to study daily, both as individuals and as families, namely the Book of Mormon. I love that book. It is the book that will get a person nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than any other book. Near the end of his address, he mentioned, the Lord inspired his servant Lorenzo Snow to reemphasize the principle of tithing, to redeem the church from financial bondage. In those days, the general authorities took that message to the members of the church. Now in our day, the Lord has revealed the need to reemphasize the Book of Mormon, to get the church and all the children of Zion out from under condemnation, the scourge and judgment. This message must be carried to the members of the church throughout the world. I thought it likely in the President Benson's next conference address, he might place emphasis on the New Testament or the Doctrine and Covenants. But what did he do? He gave another powerful address on the Book of Mormon, 
we should read that address again and again. In it, he said, My beloved brethren and sisters, today I would like to speak about one of the most significant gifts given to the world in modern times. The gift I'm thinking of is more important than any of the inventions that have come out of the industrial and technological revolutions. This is a, a gift of greater value to mankind than even the many wonderful advances we've seen in modern medicine. It is of greater worth to mankind than the development of flight or space travel. The spe I speak of the gift of the Book of Mormon. He then asked, has the fact that we've had the Book of Mormon with us for over a century and a half made it seem less significant to us today? And he clarified, the Book of Mormon is the keystone of the doctrine of the resurrection. The Lord himself has stated that the Book of Mormon contains the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That does not mean it contains every teaching, every doctrine ever revealed. Rather, it means that, that in the Book of Mormon, we will find the fullness of those doctrines required for our salvation, close quote. We have the book. We're also under condemnation if we do not take it seriously and do all we personally can to apply literally in our lives those precepts contained in the Book of Mormon. We must do this if we are to achieve our ultimate goal of salvation and exaltation. We live in a world in which we witness much of the carnal, sensual, and devilish nature of so many. The media is awash with immoral and violent images. Conflicts and bloodshed are common throughout the world. Christianity is being attacked from all sides. Abortion has depreciated the value of life. Traditional marriage and the family are being attacked on many fronts. Heinous sexual transgressions occur, and many of them are condoned by a public devoid of conscience. War, poverty, genocide, and starvation plague millions around the world, and the list could go on and on. The Book of Mormon has come to us at a critical time in this world's existence. We need all the help we can get on a personal and worldwide scale. This sacred record already helps millions at the deepest level of our personal practical needs, and I hope in the future its influence will be greatly expanded. I tried an experiment. I know what the Book of Mormon means to me in my life, and I decided it would be interesting to conduct an informal poll. So I requested that more than 100 member friends and acquaintances respond to a simple questionnaire, which was this request. Please indicate at least one of the scriptures, doctrines, teachings, or experiences you have had with the Book of Mormon that you feel has helped you draw closer to the Lord or to have improved your life. The responses were enlightening to me for a variety of reasons. There was such a wide diversity in the verses or portions of the Book of Mormon that have had a positive impact in the lives of readers. Their responses came from expected and unexpected areas of the book. I w it was as though a person could be moved or affected at a life-changing level from almost any page in the Book of Mormon. One of the respondents and her husband had a severe economic disaster, potential loss of their home, and a family member with a life-threatening disease. With permission, I share some of what she wrote of her experience with Mosiah chapter 7, verses 32 and 33, where she read, And now, behold, the promise of the Lord is fulfilled, and ye are smitten and afflicted. <laughs> this family surely was smitten and afflicted. She read on. But if he will, <clears throat> turn to the Lord with full purpose of heart and put your trust in him and serve him with all of your mind. If you do this, he will, according to his own will and pleasure, deliver you out of bondage. She wrote that scripture has sustained me during one of the lowest points of my life when things seem to come crushing in on us because of the promise in verse 32. I turn to the Lord with full purpose of heart, with absolute confidence and unconditionally. I put my trust in him and tried to serve him with all diligence of mind and with all my heart and every fiber of my being. I relied on the hope that if you do this, he will, according to his own will and pleasure, deliver you out of bondage. I felt and seen the fulfillment of this promise because I have felt of his love for us. 
and receive the knowledge that he is always there. I love the Lord with all my heart, and I will be forever a debtor, not only for delivering us out of our bondage, but primarily for his infinite atonement. This is my testimony, close quote. A sister whose husband walked out on their temple marriage for another woman, leaving her and their children, wrote about her experience with Nephi's soliloquy in 2 Nephi chapter 4, verses 15 through 35. She wrote, each time I read it, the spirit washes over me and I come away feeling my courage refreshed and my commitment renewed. When I first read this, I felt that I had been heard, not just by our Heavenly Father and Jesus, but somehow. I felt the Nephi knew my heart and my feelings. I suppose that the comfort I received from reading his words is much like the comfort he describes in reading the words of Isaiah. Each time I read this passage, I realize that everyone struggles, even prophets. I see his example of how to pick yourself up out of the mire of self-pity and to throw yourself into self-improvement. I come away with a desire to be great like Nephi was. She went on to mention her experience with another verse, 2 Nephi chapter 2, verse 2, which reads, Nevertheless, Jacob, my firstborn in the wilderness, thou knowest the greatness of God, and he shall consecrate thine afflictions for thy gain. She wrote, my mother-in-law brought this to my attention. She had been gone to the hospital for a serious illness. She said one day, in the early morning hours, she awoke and couldn't sleep. She had a bad feeling and wanted some comfort. She found the copy of the Book of Mormon in her room and flipped it open to read. This verse came to her, and she realized that there must surely be something important for her to learn, and that it would be for her gain, just as Jacob's afflictions were to him. She shared this with me because it was the summer when my divorce from her son was happening, and I was truly wondering, why me? Why now? Why this? And so on. This scripture brought such indescribable peace to my soul. I was led to remember and recognize that Heavenly Father knows me. He knows my trials and consecrates them specifically for my gain. I got a sense of holiness about them. It's not always easy to think of trials in that way, but I al it always helps me when I do." Close quote. One of the responses came from a distinguished scientist who had been trained in physics and chemistry at the University of Utah under the tutelage of Dr. Henry Eyring and others. He then went to the East where he worked for a leading corporation and became responsible for the work of more than 200 PhD level research scientists. He wrote, in my early life as a budding scientist, I was constantly challenged by my non-member colleagues with what they conceived to be the conflicts between science and religion. I had a hard time explaining to them why my scientific training strengthened my belief and why their training destroyed theirs. On several occasions, well-known scientists expressed to me privately a desire to believe as I did, but professed that their intellectual and cultural upbringings were insurmountable barriers. I found it difficult to explain in scientific terms why I had a testimony of the gospel and they did not. So I often resorted to citing evidence of the miracles of life and the majesty of the underlying laws of chemistry and physics. These citations proved to be interesting, but insufficient to satisfy either me or my fellow students or scientists. Somehow, the key to true belief was missing. Then one day I came upon these words of the Lord recorded by Moroni in Ether chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Come unto me, O ye Gentiles, and I will show unto you the greater things, the knowledge which is hid up because of unbelief. This logically led to the question, unbelief in what? Unbelief in what I had told them, unbelief in the temporal evidences supporting the scriptures? No, much more than that as is made clear in the next verse. Come unto me, O ye house of Israel, and it shall be made manifest unto you how great things the Father had laid up for you from the foundation of the world, and it hath not come unto you because of unbelief. Here was the key. The starting point for a testimony of the gospel is the first principle of the gospel, 
faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This principle as is inviolate as the law of gravity. Defy it and the result is predictable, darkness and unbelief. Follow it and, and that knowledge hid by unbelief will be revealed. Close quote. What he learned from the Book of Mormon helped sustain him and help him achieve success in his profession, in his family, and in many significant church callings. The Book of Mormon teaches powerfully, covering a broad range of precepts and doctrines. A presentation such as this can include only a few of a multitude of helpful precepts and doctrines from the Book of Mormon that can help us draw nearer to God. I would like to mention five specific particular areas. First, doctrines resolving the question, how are we saved? The Book of Mormon provides us with motivational precepts that help us draw nearer to God. We need to recognize that the Book of Mormon provides any serious student with monumental cognitive, intellectual, and rational insights that provide answers to many of the age-old theological debates. For example, the significant theological question, how are we saved? Different answers to this question have caused much dissension and bloodshed over the centuries among those who consider themselves to be Christian. Vestiges of the conflict between Catholics and Protestants exist even to this day in various parts of the world. The Roman Catholics have essentially taught that for man to be saved, God's saving grace is communicated to man exclusively through the good offices of the authorized church that include the sacraments or ordinances rightly administered by their clergy. In contrast, Martin Luther, along with others interested in reform, protested against the position that salvation came through the priests, sacraments, indulgences, and good offices or works of the church. He believed and taught that no one stood between a person and the Lord, that every man was in a way, his own priest. Of Apostle Paul's epistles, Luther's favorite was that to the Galatians, where we read, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. Dr. W. Graham Scroge stated, Galatians, this epistle, was the battle axe which Luther brought down with terrific and telling force upon the helmets of his foes in the Catholic Church. Regarding this Protestant doctrine of justification by faith, Dr. Paul Tillich wrote that it has divided the old unity of Christendom, has torn asunder Europe and especially Germany, has made innumerable martyrs, has kindled the bloodiest and most terrible wars of the past, and has deeply affected European history, and with it, the history of humanity." Close quote. How can a person return to the presence of God, justified, cleansed, becoming an heir to the highest blessings God has promised to the faithful? Does this come primarily through the authority of the Catholic Church, its priesthood, and the good offices, or as the, the Protestants believe, is it a gift that comes strictly as a result of faith and grace? The differences between the Catholic and Protestant theologies as to how we are saved are yet wide and deep. Never could these polar positions be reconciled without the light of additional revelation. Fortunately, the revelations of the Prophet Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon shed light on this universally divisive question, how are we saved? For that we should be eternally grateful. In a most intellectually satisfying way, the Book of Mormon brings together in just one verse the polar differences that have divided Christianity for centuries. Nephi taught, for we labor diligently to write to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God, for we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. Yes. We are saved by the grace of God and do not earn salvation, regardless of how many good works we may do. But Nephi included that very important clause, after all we can do. Our good works or all that we can do demonstrate that we're willing to work for and receive the salvation that is offered to us by divine grace. 
King Benjamin emphasized the relative position of grace and works in his well-known moving discourse. I say unto you that if ye should serve him who has created you from the beginning and is preserving you from day to day by lending you breath, that ye may live and move and do according to your own will, and even supporting you from one moment to another, I say if you should serve him with all your whole souls, that is, do all the good works, yet ye would be unprofitable servants, close quote. Even if we served him with all our whole souls, we would still receive through grace more than we ever could earn. As this doctrine of salvation by grace, so clearly taught in the Book of Mormon, is better understood by church members, we may observe greater evidences of humility and have fewer problems of reverence in sacrament meetings. We may sing with even more feeling, I stand all amazed at the love Jesus offers me. In our teaching, perhaps we should place less emphasis on the idea that we work out our own salvation, because that is impossible for a human being to do through his own efforts without receiving God's grace. Thus, our position rationally allows us to agree in part with the emphasis the Catholics placed on the importance of priesthood authority and the sacraments or ordinances of the church rightly administered. At the same time, we agree with the Protestants that salvation and even exaltation comes to us by grace as a gift from a loving and merciful Heavenly Father. We can and must emphasize the importance of grace and works or obedience to all the commandments so that after all we can do, we demonstrate we're willing to receive the blessing and the blessed gift of salvation by grace, thereby the privilege to return again to the presence of our Heavenly Father. Number two, dangers growing from the sin of pride. Repeatedly, in the Book of Mormon cautions us to avoid the sin of pride. The Book of Mormon describes several cycles in which the church, after achieving prosperity, was brought down by the pride of its members. President Benson, C.S. Lewis, and others have said that pride is the universal sin. That means every one of us, to one degree or another, suffers from the problem. No one of us is completely free from its effects, but we must do all in our power to overcome its influence in our lives. No book teaches us more effectively than the Book of Mormon about the need to avoid or overcome the negative influence of pride in our lives. Times of relative prosperity, such as those we're experiencing in our country at this time, are periods of great danger. In 3rd Nephi, we read a passage that we could easily liken unto our relatively prosperous time. And they began again to prosper and to wax great, and now there was nothing in all the land to hinder the people from prospering continually, except they should fall into transgression. And it came to pass that there were many cities built anew, and there were many old cities repaired, and there were many highways cast up which led from city to city, and from land to land. But it came to pass, there began to be some disputings among the people, and some were lifted up unto pride and boastings because of their exceedingly great riches, yea, even unto great persecutions. For there were many merchants in the land, and also many lawyers and officers. And the people began to be distinguished by ranks according to their riches and their chances for learning. Yea, some were ignorant because of their poverty, and others did receive great learning because of their riches. Some were lifted up in pride, and thus there became a great inequality in all the land, insomuch that the church began to be broken up." Close quote. It appears that prosperity and pride were destroyed by the disruptive effects of human pride no less than 30 times throughout the Book of Mormon. Opportunities for education and training are relative prosperity, and the stratified society make overcoming inappropriate pride a genuine challenge. Our cup of advantages is very full, and as the English proverb states, a full cup must be carried steadily. Just after finishing graduate school, I, I was visiting with an acquaintance. He was much older, probably twice my age. Earlier in his career, he had gone back east to a major university and received some graduate training from a few of the scholars in his field. 
In the course of our conversation, my friend criticized leaders of the church and some of the policies that he felt should long since have been changed. Then he said the words that still ring in my memory. You see, Joe, I am an intellectual. In my experience, the genuine intellectual does not need to announce it. Since that time, my friend spent his life on the fringe, speaking, writing, and associating with those who felt they knew more than the designated church leaders. His criticism negatively affected his wife, the way I saw it, their children, and their grandchildren. In my mind, he seemed to become an incarnation of the attitude that we read in 2 Nephi. Oh, that cunning plan of the evil one. Oh, the vainness and the frailties and the foolishness of men. When they're learned, they think they are wise, and they hearken not unto the counsels of God. For they set it aside, supposing they know of themselves. Wherefore, their wisdom is foolishness, and it profiteth them not, and they shall perish. But to be learned is good, if they hearken unto the counsels of God. Close quote. Therein lies a challenge for all of us who receive the opportunities of higher education to avoid becoming trapped by the sin of pride. Succumbing to it could cause us to perish spiritually. Robert J. McCracken wrote, If we make a listing of our sins, pride is the one that heads the list, breeds all the rest, and does more to estrange us from our neighbors or from God than any evil we can commit. In this aspect, it is not only the worst of the seven deadly sins, it is the parent sin, the one that leads to every other, the sin from which no one is free, pride of rank, the delight taken in status, recognition, honors, in being at the head of the table, the top of the line, pride of intellect, the arrogance that thinks it knows more than it does, forgets the finiteness of the human mind, talks in terms of morons, smiles at the cultural crudity of contemporaries, pride of power, the passion to achieve it, to wield more and more of it, to feel superior to others, to give orders with a strident voice and move men about like pawns on a chessboard, close quote. Pride creeps up on us because as human beings, we have a remarkable capacity to fall under its influence even when we think we are in the safest of religious settings. A Carthusian monk who was explaining his monastic order to an inquirer said, when it comes to good works, we don't match the Benedictines. When it comes to preaching, we're not in a class with the Dominicans. The Jesuits are way ahead of us in learning. But in the matter of humility, we're tops. Close quote. <laughs> Even in church callings, there can be danger. We may fall into the trap of aspiring to some position or another. That would be almost like praying, Father, I want to serve. Use me in an executive position. <laughs> Remember that even the greatest of all, our Savior, Redeemer, and Creator of worlds without number, set the example of humble service by kneeling and washing his disciples' feet. Where we serve, as we know, doesn't matter. How we serve matters a great deal. Many become desirous of being in a position of honor or recognition. I think of the example Nephi set for us in terms of humility and not seeking positions of honor. When the Savior appeared to the Nephites at Bountiful, he invited the multitude to come forward one by one and feel his side in the nail prints in his hands and feet so they could receive a tangible witness that he literally was resurrected. He then asked for Nephi. He had not elbowed his way to the front of the group. Where was Nephi? We read, and it came to pass that he spake unto Nephi, for Nephi was among the multitude. And he commanded him that he should come forth. And Nephi arose and went forth and bowed himself before the Lord and did kiss his feet. It's always better to be invited to take a place of recognition or honor rather than to assume that we should be there. Book of Mormon precepts teach that we can become overly concerned about the organizations we belong to, which side of town we live on, the size of our home, how much money we have, what race or nationality we are, what kind of car we drive, what church we belong to, how much education we've been privileged to acquire, what we wear, 
and so on. How many times in the Book of Mormon do we read about the spiritually negative consequences of wearing fine twined linen and costly apparel? We should place our concern on simple, less worldly things. In our mercenary and materialistic society, we could also learn from what Henry David Thoreau said, my greatest skill has been to want but little. Precepts taught in the Book of Mormon more than in any other book help us overcome these spiritually destructive tendencies of pride. Third, the need to defend values, even to bloodshed if necessary. President Benson clearly indicated that one of the reasons we must focus on the Book of Mormon is that it was written for our day. The Nephites never had the book. Neither did the Lamanites of ancient times. It was meant for us. Mormon wrote near the end of the Nephite civilization, under the inspiration of God, who sees all things from the beginning. He abridged centuries of records, choosing the stories, speeches, and events that would be most helpful to us. Frankly, in some of my earlier readings of the Book of Mormon, I get a little tired of so many pages on the wars between the Nephites and Lamanites. However, the last time Barbara and I recently finished reading the Book of Mormon, these turbulent times had more relevance for me in our turbulent, war-torn world today. Approximately one out of every ten pages in the Book of Mormon deals with the life and times of Captain Moroni, which we read in Alma chapters 43 clear through 63. Basically, these were times of war. They were times when enemies arose who wanted to kill those who followed Christ and to wipe them from the face of the earth. There are those in the world today who would like to do the same to us. Captain Moroni was inspired to know that values of inestimable worth must be preserved, even if it means fighting a defensive war to protect them, even if it means giving up our very lives, as we read, Inasmuch as ye are not guilty of the first offense, neither the second, ye shall not suffer yourselves to be slain by the hands of your enemies. And again the Lord has said that ye shall defend your families, even unto bloodshed. Therefore for this cause were the Nephites contending with the Lamanites to defend themselves and their families, their lands, their country, and their rights, and their religion. Close quote. We live in a time of prophesied wars and rumors of war. Moroni clearly saw our day and prophesied, and there shall also be heard of wars, rumors of wars, and earthquakes in divers places. The Lord, through the prophet Joseph in our dispensation, made it very clear that in that, that, in that day shall be heard the rumors of wars, and the whole earth shall be in commotion, and men's hearts shall fail them. The Lord said, and thus with the sword and by bloodshed the inhabitants of the earth shall and with plague and earthquake and the thunder of heaven and the fierce and vivid lightning until the consumption decreed hath made a full end of all nations the messages contained in the book of mormon help prepare our minds and hearts to cope with an era when wars are being fought in many parts of the world we learn that our challenges are to stand in holy places and to remain firm in defending those values which are more precious than our mortal lives themselves. Four, the need for heroes today. The most powerful precepts are taught through the exemplary lives of righteous, capable, and heroic individuals. No other volume of scripture provides us with so many exemplary lives from which to pattern our own as does the Book of Mormon. Example, for good or ill, is the most powerful of precepts. As Ralph Waldo Emerson said, who you are, speak so loudly I can't hear what you're saying. For many we live in, in a world lacking genuine heroes. It has been noted that we live in a cynical age which now accepts the tarnished coin of celebrity in place of heroic virtue. Our young people today need heroes who go beyond the popular rock stars, musicians, comedians, great athletes, the rich and the famous. They and all of us need to come to know of heroic characters, such as those in the Book of Mormon, whose influence will live long after the applause from, for those who are currently popular 
has faded away. Retired Brigadier General Joe Foss, a recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor said, America needs a new generation of heroes, people who are ruled by a conscience that doesn't take the Ten Commandments lightly, who have a fundamental reverence for their creator and a respect for the people and things he has created. Anyone who's really studied the Book of Mormon will never lack for heroes to emulate. In fact, the, a book entitled Heroes from the Book of Mormon highlights many individuals' lives, including Nephi, Jacob, Enos, King Benjamin, Abinadi, the two Almas, Captain Moroni, Mormon, and Mormon's son Moroni. In the book, Elder Russell M. Nelson summarizes Nephi, the son of Father Lehi, as one of the genuine heroes of the Book of Mormon. He describes him, Nephi was a multifaceted genius, endowed with great physical stature. He was a prophet, teacher, ruler, colonizer, builder, craftsman, scholar, writer, poet, military leader, and father of nations. Nephi had a sincere desire to know the mysteries of God. He became a special witness and trusted prophet of the Lord. Close quote. And Mormon, describing Captain Moroni, recorded, if all men had been and were and ever would be, like unto Moroni, behold, the very powers of hell would have been shaken forever. Yea, the devil would never have power over the hearts of the children of men. And of the prophet Moroni, who delivered the place to the prophet Joseph, President Gordon B. Hinckley wrote, of all the characters who walked the pages of the Book of Mormon, none stands a greater hero, save Jesus only, than does Moroni, son of Mormon. Now finally, our ultimate objective, come unto Christ and be perfected in Him. I remember years ago being impressed by a statement made by Truman G. Madsen, to be or not to be, that is not the question. The reality is that a part of us is co-eternal with God. We are, we live, and we do exist. As Brother Madsen went on to say, what is the question? The question is not one of being, but of becoming. To become more or not to become more. This is the question faced by each intelligence in our universe. Close quote. What is our ultimate objective? What can we progress to become? What did the Savior mean when he included in the Sermon on the Mount the statement, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect? Some scholars claim that when the Savior taught, he often used hyperbole or exaggeration to dramatize his demands. Such interpretations are not found in Elder James E. Talmadge's Jesus the Christ. Elder Talmadge notes, Our Lord's admonition to men to become perfect, even as the Father is perfect, cannot rationally be construed otherwise than as implying the possibility of such achievement. So, rather than interpreting the Lord's statement in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, as exaggerated idealism or scriptural hyperbole, we should believe the Lord meant what he said. Our goal is to become perfect, even as our, our Father in heaven is perfect. We'll not achieve that end in mortality, obviously. But through the divine principle of eternal progression, we can. Many outside our faith consider such doctrine blasphemy. But the Book of Mormon helps to clarify the issue. When the Lord appeared in the Western Hemisphere, he reiterated much of the Sermon on the Mount, and in 3 Nephi chapter 12, verse 48, we read, Therefore I would that ye should be even as I, or your Father who is in heaven is perfect. Clearly to achieve such a lofty goal, we need to change our hearts. We need to lose the disposition to do evil, like those who listen to King Benjamin's address. We need to become the kind of people the Lord intends us to become. As indicated in that rhetorical question, he asked of his Nephite disciples, Therefore, what manner of men ought ye to be? Verily I say unto you, even as I am. In other words, we need to do more than just go through the motions and do the works, but literally to become as he is. In a powerful general conference address entitled The Challenge to Become Elder Dallin H. Oaks, stressed that more is required than just doing a quantity of good works. We must literally be changed, born again. We must become what our Heavenly Father desires us to become. Elder Oaks then used a parable to make his point. 
a wealthy father knew that if he were to bestow his wealth upon a child who had not yet developed the needed wisdom and stature, the inheritance would probably be wasted. The father said to his child, all that I have I desire to give you, not only my wealth, but also my position and standing among men. That which I have, I can easily give you, but that which I am, you must obtain for yourself. You will qualify for your inheritance by learning what I have learned and by living as I have lived. I will give you the laws and principles by which I have acquired my wisdom and stature. Follow my example, mastering as I have mastered, and you will become as I am, and all that I have will be yours. To become like our Savior and Father in heaven is the goal of every committed Latter-day Saint. The knowledge of such potential is motivational and makes each day of life more purposeful that is an idea that merits much more time, effort, and thought, and discussion, even a lifetime, and on into the eternities. More than any other book, the Book of Mormon invites us to come unto Christ. As Moroni wrote, Come unto Christ, and be perfected in Him, and deny yourselves of all ungodliness. And if ye shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness, and love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then is his grace sufficient for you, that by his grace ye may be perfect in Christ. And if by the grace of God ye are perfect in Christ, ye can in no wise deny the power of God. In the last verse of the Book of Mormon, Moroni records, And I now bid unto all farewell. I soon go to rest in the paradise of God until my spirit and body shall again reunite, and I am brought forth triumphant through the air to meet before the pleasing bar of the great Jehovah, the eternal judge of both quick and dead." Close quote. I'm confident that if we abide by the precepts taught in the Book of Mormon, the meeting before that bar will be much more pleasing than if we don't. With President Brigham Young, I feel like shouting hallelujah all the time that I think I ever knew Joseph Smith and the inspiration and revelations he received. Through the inspiration he received and translated miraculously, he brought forth the Book of Mormon, which contains the precepts that can bring us nearer to God than any other book. Of that, I am thoroughly convinced and eternally grateful. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you very much. For more information on this Sperry Symposium address, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org. This Sidney B. Sperry Symposium Address by Elder Joe J. Christensen was given on October 26, 2007.